Good afternoon. Um, my name is Alex Mazur. Uh, I want to start by thanking David, Bill, and the Brookings team for hosting this event. Um, and delighted to be here to talk a little bit about the lessons from the perspective of public employee pensions. Uh, and I have to say, I'm a, a dual citizen, so I'm well aware of the cultural differences between the two countries and the challenges of translating something that works well in, in Canada into something that maybe doesn't work so well in the US. But there is one counterexample, which is my favorite baseball team growing up, was the Montreal Expos, which didn't work quite as well north of the border, but actually translated very well into uh, the DC environment. So that gives me a <laughs> sense of optimism for uh, our panel today. Uh, um, so uh, when Americans think about world-class, top-performing organizations, public pension funds are not exactly what spring to mind. Um, and yet, public pensions is one thing uh, that Canada does uh, very well. And even though that's something that many Canadians are not uh, aware of. Uh, Canadian public pension organizations have drawn the attention of The Economist, Fortune, and the Financial Times, and are the subject of a new uh, World Bank report that will be coming out uh, later in November. Uh, delegations from all over the world come to visit these funds to learn uh, how they do what they do. Uh, but the story of these pension plans is relevant to the U.S. not just because of how they look today, uh, but because of where they were 20 to 30 years ago. Uh, many of them faced severe funding crises, uh, they were poorly governed, uh, and many of them were invested only in non-marketable uh, government bonds. Um, so today, um, some of the features of the Canadian pension plans are, are going to be covered by our panelists today. Uh, we think that this has relevance both for issues of local and state employee pensions, uh, but also for the design and management of some of the new state-sponsored plans that are being set up in places like California, Oregon, and Maryland. I'm delighted to have three key pension leaders from both sides of the border with us today. Uh, Jim Kahane, uh, immediately to my left, is president and CEO of the Healthcare of Ontario Pension Plan, which has over 320,000 members, uh, 500 employer uh, participants, and about $70 billion in assets under management. Uh, prior to becoming CEO, uh, Jim was the organization's CIO, Chief Investment Officer, a role in which he developed a pioneering approach to liability-driven investing. And he also recently served on the advisory board uh, for the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan, which was supplanted by the CPP increase we heard about earlier uh, and was our version of a, a state-sponsored plan. Uh, Hugh O'Reilly is President and CEO of OP Trust, which has uh, about 90,000 members in the Ontario public sector. Uh, $19 billion of assets under management. Uh, before becoming CEO, he was a pensions lawyer for both management and labor, uh, including serving as board counsel for several major public pension plans. And he also uh, played a senior role in government at the time when uh, many of these plans were first being set up. Uh, finally, uh, Josh Gottbaum is no stranger to uh, the Brookings community. Uh, like Jim, Josh has a financial services background, having worked in investment banking and private equity. Uh, like Hugh, uh, he's worked in government as head of the PBGC, which invests uh, $85 billion U.S. in Treasury and OMB. Uh, he's a guest scholar at Brookings and chair of the Maryland Small Business Retirement Savings Board. So uh, in order to get our discussion going, we're going to try to have a conversation today. Um, I want to take us back a little bit to the 1990s, which when Canada was not in good financial shape. Uh, and starting with Hugh, could you tell us a little bit about what Canadian plans were like in the 90s and why they were reformed? Well, uh, thanks, Alex. And um, first of all, uh, one item of fake news about Canada I want to clear up. When I ever I watch the weather down here, you always talk about bad weather from coming from Canada, and I just the weather today came from Canada. We brought it with. Yeah. You. So I, I just wanted to clear that up. And in that spirit, I do want to clear up a little bit about uh, the Canadian example. I think too often uh, when we're talked about as an example. We, uh, the present state is compared to the present state in the U.S. And I'm not sure that's the best way of looking at this issue. In the late 80s and early 90s, the Canadian public sector pension plan area was under a lot of stress. It was badly run. It was badly governed. Most of the plans were, with the exception of HOOP at that time, most of the plans were essentially pay-as-you-go plans. So the uh, employees put their money in, the government, or, uh, the government put its money in, by just giving a piece of paper, essentially a, a non-marketable government bond. What this did was created a lot of pressures as fewer people started, uh, as there were people retired, fewer people working, it put a cash crunch on it. Government responded by increasing contributions 
on both sides, but typically it fell to the members. This was a fight that the public sector unions got into starting in the, in the late 80s and into the 90s. Uh, it started with the teacher unions uh, fighting against this. That's what led to the creation of the Ontario uh, Teachers Pension Plan. It's also uh, a plan that's governed on both sides, uh, representatives on both sides. It's where the uh, OP Trust uh, came from and there are other examples as, uh, as we go into the future. But the, the fundamental, and at the time, doing this politically, uh, no one cheered this. Uh, we put this, and we were an unpopular government that I was part of for a whole bunch of really good reasons, but this did not add to our popularity. History has judged it as being the right thing to do, but at the time it was criticized. So in order for this model to take place, you needed a series of ingredients. You needed the, uh, the members of the plan to take action and to push their point of view. You needed political will, uh, which was created by uh, the unions taking their action, and you needed to create a sensible governance structure and something that in the long term was fiscally prudent, which is difficult for uh, politicians. Yeah, Jim, do you want to talk a little bit about, because a lot of major reforms to your plan happened in the 1990s, and what, what was a little bit of the origins of that? Yeah, so I mean, our, our plan has been in, it was in existence since 1960, so it actually was a fully funded uh, plan. So one of, the, one of the things that's interesting about HOOP is that we're actually, we're actually not a government entity, we're actually a private trust, the, we're, we're the, which was created by an agreement between the uh, uh, unions and, and the uh, management of the uh, hospitals in Ontario, but uh, um, prior to the 1990s, it was actually a, a, a solely sponsored by the, by, the, by, the, um, by the employer, so the Ontario Hospital Association. Um, and there was some issues in, in the 1980s, the returns are very good, so the fund was in a surplus position, so the employers took a uh, contribution holiday and uh, didn't share it with the employees, and so the unions didn't like that very much, and uh, so there was a, uh, a court case uh, happened around that, uh, and it ended up being a financial services tri tribunal decision, which actually created the joint governance structure. So, so our board is set up, is made up of half of, of uh, appointees from uh, union representatives and half uh, appointees from management representatives. So it's, uh, but it is actually a private trust. So, so the uh, uh, it is essentially like a. Um, uh, equivalent to a, a mutual insurance structure. So the fact can be the members of the plan own the plan. So, um, uh, so, so, and, and uh, what what that uh, that that change in governance actually allowed us to move down a different path, which was uh, running the, running the plan solely for the the, the benefit benefit of the members. Uh, which led us uh, down a completely different path in terms of how the plan was being run. So it was moved from uh, essentially a, an outsourced organization to one that we, where we started to run the money internally and, and, and do things that were really were in the interest of, of ensuring that we deliver on the pension promise to members. But again, it was it was a rough transition. Uh, uh, it didn't, didn't take place uh, easily. It took a lot of uh, back and forth to get to where we got to. Now, now, Josh, you've done a lot of work in, in pensions on, in the U.S., and you've had a chance to look a little bit about at these Canadian plans and, and the way they're governed, the way that they're run. What would you highlight as some of the key, maybe, differences and similarities when you look at a Canadian plan versus a typical Can we US? bring up your slide, what I think of oh, as yeah. your slide? <laughs> oh, Where's who's it? got the clicker? Oh. There we go. Nope. Let's try this. Next. There we go. Bingo. Okay. Uh, full disclosure, I'm the only member of my immediate family who is not a Canadian citizen. So, um, I would say the important differences from U.S. practice are several, and I hope that we will discuss how they came about. Um, one that I'll start with, because I think it's really economically significant, but is not... Um, was not a, a source of major reform, is that the actuaries in Canada are more conservative than the actuaries in America. And as a result, when you look at the discount rate that these plans use, it runs 5 to 6 percent currently. Uh, there, are some that are, there are some that are lower, et cetera. When you look at public plans in the United States, they have historically been higher and are moving down 
courtesy of the Government Accounting Standards Board. But they have still been sufficiently higher. I mention this because it is the, the source, the most important source of dramatic underfunding in U.S. plans. And, uh, and it is a difference which is structural and forever. And uh, Yusuf's point about apologizing to the actuaries for criticizing them, I'm not going to criticize the Canadian actuaries. But my friends um, in the American Academy, sorry, blew it. That's an important difference. The other important differences that, from my perspective, really matter is that the level of professionalization of these plans, and that does not mean that the American plans are not professional by any means, but it does mean that the American plans started from traditional government pay scales and organization, that they're trustee programs were done, uh, were politically determined, that, and that led to political influences in the, tr the direction from trustees. And so I would say the, and the one that I hope we will get a chance to talk about uh, at, at some length is that whereas the American plans be kept pay low, in order to hire talent, they didn't call them employees. They called them consultants or managers of funds of funds. And when you look at the comparative cost between the best Canadian plans and the American plans, the costs, the net cost, appear to be on the same order of magnitude, but the, re the differences are profound. And as a result, the Canadian plans have been able to engage in direct investment rather than doing what the American plans do. If the American plans want to uh, engage in infrastructure investment, they look around for a fund manager that says, we will gather investments for you, and they will pay that fund manager a fee on top of the, the cost of the investment. So there are very significant differences. I, and I hope we will talk about those and defer until later in the discussion how we get the Americans to pay attention to those differences. Yeah, I, I want to come back to the question of, of organization and people and talent a little bit later because I think it's, it's critical. But maybe we can go back to the issue of governance, which was touched on briefly, and go a little bit deeper on that. Um, governance is often identified as one of the key drivers of performance in pension organizations. It's also a politically sensitive topic. Um, and I'd love to know from you, Hugh, how has the governance of Canadian plans evolved over the years, and what did it used to look like, and, and can you paint a picture of, of what it looks like today? Well, I think it, initially when these plans, before they became jointly sponsored, they were either uh, run as arms of the provincial government or, or they were run by the employer associations. And the, the difficulty with that is the priority for the plan becomes uh, the interest of, uh, or has the potential to become the interest of the sponsor. So the government's objective is to minimize its cash, its cash outflows and its expenditures, and it, it uh, governs itself accordingly. Jim referred to uh, some of the past battles in the past where employers uh, took contribution holidays and employees didn't share in them. When joint governance was thought of, which is like the equivalent of the Taft-Hartley down here, there was an initial reaction that, oh my God, you're going to put uh, uh, working people at the table and they're going to do crazy things. They're going to want to increase benefits. They're going to want to lower contributions. God help us, they might even want to do socially responsible investments. This was the, <laughs> the fear that was articulated. Well, what ended up happening is, first of all, uh, uh, the individuals who represented uh, their members Fundamentally, they understood their role was to represent their members' interests. From a legal point of view, a pension plan's obligation is to its members. So immediately, they went there with a mindset that wasn't focused on short-termism or just trying to do things that were politically expedient. I think that was important. I think they were properly supported both by uh, professional advisors, lawyers, uh, actuaries, accountants, and others. And then I think as these organi organizations uh, staffed up in certain cases, they hired uh, people who uh, were um, 
who could have made could make a lot more money if they worked in the financial sector. They still don't. No one's going to have to not going to have to do a bake sale for for uh, Jim and Jim or me. But uh, we you make less than you would in the financial sector. But it's people who are motivated around the issue of ensuring that the benefits can be paid and the challenges that come from a pension plan. If so, I, if I may interject, however, on average. The level of compensation on these Canadian plans is very significantly higher. In America, as a general practice, we simply do not allow public employees to be paid. And we view public plans as an outgo through public employees. And we don't allow them to be paid. Well, and, and to put our costs in perspective, uh, our fund, which is $19.2 billion, which is not a large fund, and we internally manage uh, by Canadian standards, and we internally manage our alternatives and now our bonds, FX, and certain derivatives products. The cost of running our money, uh, our money, our investments is 24 basis points. The cost of administering the benefits, because we also do that for our members, is 11. Total cost is 35 basis points. So I, I think that compares very well to any fee, any fee base. We have well diversified. We have offices in different countries, and we uh, we're on a 3.4% real discount rate. We're fully funded on a market rate, which, which takes account of smoothing. We're 110% funded, and our board is uh, laser focused on the funded position. So those are the things we're able to accomplish, I think, in large part because we internally manage and we have a form of liability-driven investing as well, and we're able to do that because we internally manage our money. Could you, could, it would, I think it would help the American audience if you talked a little bit about how there came to be a consensus that these plans should be run in effect as businesses, even though they are public entities. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it's, uh, I would say that happened in an evolutionary way. I mean, I, I think <coughs> one of the key moments was that, um, uh, you know, as you mentioned earlier, there was, there was some, uh, the, the teacher's plan, the entire teacher's pension plan was, was, was created around 1990, and part of that had been, it had been just uh, part of the century, the, the government treasury, and it was a pay-as-you-go plan, and, and there was no fund, really. So part of the negotiations that teachers had with the, uh, with the government was that they were going to you know, pull these non-negotiable bonds out and actually create a fund. Uh, so it would be a properly funded plan. And uh, uh, when they set up the governance structure, the they first uh, chairman of the board was uh, a gentleman named Gerald Bowie, who had previously been the governor, uh, governor of the, uh, of the uh, Bank of Canada. And he said, I'll take the job if I can run it like a business. Mm -hmm. And that was like a key moment. And, and so um, he then hired a CEO with... Uh, uh, Cole Lammer was the general's first CEO of Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, and they went out to set it up like to run it like a business. And um, so, uh, you know, and our plan uh, about that same time had gone through this uh, shift from a single partner pension plan to a, a jointly governed plan, and the new board that took that over followed that same approach. They want to run it like a business for the for the purpose of the of, of uh, delivering pensions to members. And and. Um, uh, so, I, you know, I think that, that was sort of the key moment in time that actually created that, that changeover. Uh, and I'm wondering, Jim, uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have Jim here today because the results of the HOOP plan, if you look from an investment perspective, have been truly outstanding. Uh, there was a survey done this past year, which was a global benchmarking survey. I think of about 124 funds, peer funds from around the world, and HOOP's results have actually been the top uh, of that group. Uh, which is about 9% over the last decade. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about when you, when you say run like a business from an investor, pension investor perspective, what, what does that look like and what advice might you have for policymakers or people who run pension funds here if they want to improve net uh, investment results? Well, uh, run like a business. I mean, I think one of the big things is we have a very clear mission, which is, uh, again, delivering on the pension promise, and we, 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 make, we make all our decisions to make sure that that's what happens. So, uh, um, and... Um, one of the big things is uh, we, we have significant scale. So, uh, you know, as a $70 billion fund, it's much cheaper to run the fund with an internal management team than to outsource it. So, uh, you know, again, as you mentioned, our, our costs are very low. Our, our uh, uh, even though we're, uh, and one of the good, good things with the governance structure, it actually allows us to pay market wages to portfolio managers. So we can pay, you know, we're writing people seven-figure checks internally and uh, 
can do that because of the governance structure. So it's kind of so we're actually a private entity that's away from the government, so we're not tied to government wages. We can pay what it takes to hire people, and it's much cheaper, to, way cheaper to do that than to actually outsource to a third-party manager. So and just to give, just to put some perspective on that, when we when I took over as chief investment officer, we had 85% of our money run internally and 15% run externally. And that 15% that was run externally cost more to run than 85 we ran internally. And, and, the, uh, and the results were worse, which, which made it a very easy decision to insource it. But, but, it was, uh, uh, but another big intangible you get from, uh, from uh, having internal management is, is uh, significantly better risk management. So uh, again, there's a big focus on what risk can cause the fund to become underfunded and trying to structure an investment portfolio that, that makes sure that you uh, uh, avoid those things can put you out of business, if you will, the, 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 the big risks, and then it shifts us more towards uh, risks that are, are more manageable and, and uh, are less likely to put you out of business. So, um, uh, so uh, and, and we're, we don't get used as uh, uh, instruments of public policy. So, uh, you know, the government come out and say, you know, we want to start some R&D fund or whatever, and they can show it to us, and we can say yes or no, and nobody's going to force you to do it. So don't get used to it. Uh, but we are able to, to attract and retain top talent. So, you know, I think one of the keys to success are to have good independent governance, uh, have a clear mission, and be able to attract top talent to actually uh, execute on that. And uh, so we are, we, we, you know, we're not the highest payer in the market. Uh, as you mentioned, I mean, people can probably make more money going to work for a hedge fund or something, but, but, uh, uh, they don't, uh, for a lot of reasons. I mean, uh, we we tend to try and hire people that have sort of more of a public-minded view or and uh, think long term, uh, and uh, um, you know, working at a, at a place like ours is, is great because you have a uh, locked-in uh, money, so you don't have to go out marketing and try to raise money all the time. So, which is if you're in the hedge fund world, that's a, more your job spent doing that than actually running money. So it's so it's very attractive to some people to actually come and work for us. So we, we're not necessarily the highest pair in the street, but we want to be in the ballpark. And, and the conversation is tied, uh, tied to results, which uh, a lot of times when you're hiring outside managers, you pay them whether they do well or not. So uh, so ours is actually results. So, um, so scale is really important. Uh, it's allowed us to move into a lot of different investments that, that uh, and, and, and broaden out our, 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 uh, our scope of things we invest in. Uh, so, uh, you, know, you know, Canadian plans are, uh, there's, there's a lot of talk about, you know, the Canadian model. The Canadian model really is, uh, my view, is, is it just adds good governance, uh, uh, scale, and uh, being able to, to broaden your investment scope out to, which actually, you know, reduces your risk and it enables you to own assets that better match your liabilities and, uh, uh, and reduces risk through, through diversification. So, um, I think it is one of those magic things where you actually have reduced risk and improved returns. So. Um, uh, the, the other things I would say, you know, we, we, we do, at our scale, we, we, we can afford to spend a lot of money on, on risk systems and, uh, and control environments. So, uh, uh, you know, our, we always get a, a very shining uh, report from our accountant, from our, from our auditors, and uh, uh, because we are able to, we do have the scale to actually spend money on these things and help things, and we're constantly spending money to try and make sure we're at the leading edge of things and give us an edge on other people. So, uh, um, so we do invest in uh, uh, private uh, private equity, uh, real estate. Uh, we're not predict we're not an in infrastructure. We don't, uh, that's really just an investment choice. We feel it's it's uh, very pricey right now. It's not that we wouldn't do it, but we, at the right price we would. Uh, and we're, uh, we're we're a big user driven. It's one of the biggest in the world. Uh, and uh, the board, you know, our boards allowed us to do that. Most most uh, boards who walked in and said, uh, mentioned we're derivatives, they, they show you the door, but um, uh, it's actually allowed us to uh, significantly reduce risk in the plan and, and create structures that, that, uh, that better match our assets to our liabilities. So without good governance, none of that could happen. Um, I want to ask you a question about something that Josh raised, which is this question of compensation and the political controversy associated, the political difficulty of effectively, you know, compensating what may be perceived to be public employees more than a, a standard government employee. Uh, Hugh, you were there when a lot of these plans were set up. I wonder if you could, A, talk a little bit about that, that political challenge, how that was overcome, and also now as CEO of an organization, what is the, what does your organization look like today? What's been the kind of payoff from, from that, uh, that political shift? Well, um, 
when we, uh, the teachers plan, uh, the teachers uh, played a role in, in 1990 in defeating uh, the then Liberal government, in part because uh, they wanted to have uh, control or share in the control and decision making on their pension plan. And uh, we then they negotiated uh, with our government and uh, we uh, implemented uh, the teacher's pension plan. I, I, well, I, probably, I, I mean, I remember getting handed the deal and asking me what I thought about it. I mean, I, anyway, I don't know why they asked me, but leaving that aside, I, I thought it was fine, I guess. Uh, our plan, OP Trust, it got set up uh, in the last couple years of our government, we were <coughs> under fairly severe fiscal pressure and despite the fact we were uh, a government that had been supported by the trade union movement, we implemented what we called the social contract, which was a 5% uh, pay cut for every uh, civil servant plus everyone who worked in the public sector. I was amazingly popular at parties after that uh, set of events. <laughs> but one of the things that the union sponsor of our plan did, it had been fighting for a generation to get control and a say in its plan. It put that on the table in negotiating a deal. That's where the joint governance for OP Trust came from. Uh, OP Trust's evolution went from you know the typical using external managers to eventually hiring internal groups to run alternatives, and then recently we've added our uh, the uh, public markets uh, capabilities. And I think the evolution of these plans is all been based upon, there's been a lot of learning from mistakes. There were contribution holidays, benefit improvements taken in the late 90s around the turn of the century. Those proved to uh, be problematic to maintain after the global financial crisis. So there was a need to, in some of the plans, to increase contributions or, or, to, or to decrease be, uh, benefits. Those have happened. Our compensation structure, uh, because we internally manage, we can have alignment between our investment teams and our members. So uh, my, uh, our compensation is based on three factors. One is maintaining the funded position of the plan over 100%. Second is, as compared to a, a reference portfolio, ensuring that we take less risk. And three is preserving the surplus in the plan. But one thing I want to be really clear about, periodically there are controversies about uh, compensation in the Canadian pension plan, some plans <coughs> don't disclose their compensation. Uh, we do. Uh, one of my sponsors is the government, and one of my sponsors is, uh, is the Ontario Public Service Employees Union. So from time to time, they raise issues around uh, compensation. But the fact of the matter is, all of the plans are well governed, including ours, from a compensation perspective. Compensation advisors advise the board. They're independent. They make sure proper market studies and analysis is done. It's a competitive marketplace, so we have to make sure that we have the right people there doing the right job. But we measure our success based on our funded position, maintaining the plan's funded status, so we provide our benefits at the current price and at the current level. We call that paying pensions today, preserving pensions for tomorrow. And second, that we do it in a way that's cost effective, which is the 35 basis points all in. That culture, uh, when you link uh, in, uh, incentives to the members' interests, that creates a culture of protecting the plan. Josh, I'm wondering if I could ask you to comment broadly on the applicability of some of these aspects of the Canadian model to the U.S. Um, could be from a state and local public uh, employees mm -hmm. pension plan perspective, or even, you know, from your vantage point as chair of this of the Maryland Auto IRA that's being set up. Let me uh, do the standard thing and say I'm definitely not speaking for the Maryland uh, Small Business Retirement Savings Board. Uh, but for myself, the unfortunately in the United States, in response to underfunding, significant underfunding of the existing public pensions, the response has the response and the reaction has been channeled into some combination of raising contributions and cutting benefits. It has not been channeled into a rethinking of organization. It has not been channeled into a rethinking of investment strategy in a, in a particularly uh, comprehensive way, et cetera. And frankly, part of the reason why I hoped we would do this panel is because 
there is widespread dissatisfaction in the U.S. pensions, and in, in, in the state of U.S. public pensions, and a paucity of reasonable responses. And so one possibility is that one could say, all right, thus far you're dissatisfied with the existing system. Why not try a system in which the people who run your pension plan are paid based on performance and achieving of a funding level, which is not the case in public pensions in the U.S. Recognizing that you'll have to pay them more than other public employees. Uh, I asked earlier, what for the senior Canadian public pension plans, what are folks making and what do the senior folks make? And as Jim mentioned, some of his managers earn more than a million Canadian a year, which is $800,000 roughly uh, in, US, in US dollars. And the folks who run it earn a couple of million dollars on average. The, there are no zero heads of US public pension funds who earn $2 million US or even, I think, $2 million Canadian. So this would, what this would take, but I think it's worth a discussion, which is the reason why I have it, is does it make sense to rethink, rather than just say we should cut benefits, maybe it makes sense to rethink we should reform the organization. Maybe we should say that instead of a system which underpays the employees of the public plan and overpays the consultants to the public plan and the investment managers to the public plan, maybe you should think about direct investment. I think that is a discussion which could be, which could be had and I, which I hope this panel does. Another area that is worth mentioning is that the, the response of public plans to underfunding has been to increase their investment in risky assets. So as a result, U.S. plans, which by the way, have for decades invested in alternatives, but have invested in alternatives generally, generally through consultants or through funds of funds, and therefore pay a lot more than 24 basis points. <laughs> uh, one issue, and Jim mentioned this, is why not consider developing the capability to do direct investment? Why not, since your liabilities are long-term, why not invest in long-term assets? There is a screaming need in the U.S. for investment in infrastructure, and everybody says, why aren't pensions invest in it? And the answer is because the way U.S. pensions invest is through relatively expensive consultants attached to relatively expensive fund managers, et cetera, and they don't do what Optrust does or Hoop does. So I think there are a plenty of cases where or instances of Canadian practice that could be adopted, especially because U.S. plans at the moment have hit a wall. All they can do is say, well, let's cut future benefits on employees. I'm going to give Hugh or Jim a chance to respond if there's anything you, you want to say in response to... Oh, um, assessment. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it is much more effective to run things internally, not just from, uh, I mean, cost is one driver, but the returns will be much higher as well, just because you're, you can directly invest in assets that you otherwise would be intermediating through other people's balance sheets and you pay to use the balance sheet. So it's, it's uh, you know, so we can directly buy buildings. I mean, you know, I, I ran into one of our portfolio managers on the way down on the plane today, and uh, we were, I went with them and we looked at a couple of other things we're developing in Washington right now. So we're building something called the, the Borough at Tyson's Corners, or we know that is, and Anthem Roll, which is right at uh, 7th and uh, uh, between 9 k right across from where the uh, Apple's rebuilding the building right now at the uh, not the uh, former library that was there. But, um, uh, and, and we can, we, we're investing these kind of things. So, so we, we, we directly do these deals and we directly build buildings and they have a fund, but we would, our returns would be much lower, no question. Uh, but, uh, um, sorry, what's my thought here? Um, 
But you know, one thing I wouldn't make light of is uh, when you're trying to move in that direction, there's a huge vested interest in the financial services sector to not have you do that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because they make a lot of money off the U.S. state pension, uh, you know, they're charging those fees and they're, they're the beneficiary of it. So believe me, you're going to fight an uphill battle when you're trying to do this. Uh, big vested interest in not having you do that. So um, we fought that battle too. So. Yeah, one, one common theme from the presentation from Hassan this morning is I think the, the time it took to build stakeholder consensus around some of these changes was not something that happened overnight, and no. unions were involved in governments and, and others uh, supporting the change. Um, I want to give a chance uh, for folks Sorry, in the audience, but first to but give you a chance to respond. I think it's a continuing, it's a continual process because, you know, we're, uh, the people who work in a pension fund, those are big ticket people, so you have to constantly be reminding your stakeholders about what your purpose is, how it saves money, total costs. And I think the other advantage we have is we can focus on what really matters, which is the funded position of the plan based upon a reasonable or an appropriate market discount rate. Because when you get, because the other thing is too often these consultants in particular, probably some in the room, but they judge success <laughs> based upon uh, you know, first quartile or, or or rates of return, this kind of stuff. Well, if you're picking a first quartile manager, what the preponderant weight of academic literature supports is you're about to have a third or fourth quartile performer. Because once you're managing large sums of money, it, stock selection really doesn't, uh, doesn't have the same effect. So, you, you know, you've got to think about this and, and focusing on returns per se is not a measure of success. Yes, it contributes, but what is the funded position of the plan? What is the risk you're taking? How are you managing your risk? How are you measuring it? And how are you doing on delivering the promise? Because as that promise gets undermined, that's when you uh, really undermine the existence of the plan and the bonds of solidarity that hold it together between the young and the old. Can I add one data point to this conversation? Um, the OECD, I, as Alex mentioned, Hoop has done incredibly well. Uh, and uh, by anyone's measure, by any international measure, et cetera. What one of the things I did, thanks to Hillary Gelfand, who's sitting quietly in the front row, uh, was look at the returns in general for pension plans in Canada versus public plans in the United States, gathered from the OECD. And they produced the following statistics. In the last five years, Canadian pension funds, on average, have averaged a return of 8.3% compounded, which is, among all the countries in the OECD, the single highest. Actually, it's tied for the single highest. So it's of the 24 countries in the OECD, Canada is one of two. The United States, in the same time period, the plans measured by OECD, returned 5% versus 83 which put them which puts us in the United States 19th. So furthermore, also, thanks to Hillary, did a, um, a comparison of the variability in returns, which is one measure of risk of a couple of the major plans versus for the sample of public plans. And this higher return was achieved with lower variability of return, with less risk by one measure of risk. And so it is a really exceptional performance. But what would, I think if you looked at the statistic of, if you had normalized the discount rate and compared the funded positions of the plan, that would probably blow the top of your head off. Because I can tell you, if we had a 7% discount rate, I don't know, we'd be 100 and 35 to 140-ish percent funded, something like that. I mean, discount rates play a, a massive role in this exercise. So I want to give folks in the audience a chance to ask some questions. I think we might do what we did uh, as part of the first panel and give maybe three or four or maybe two or three questions, and then we can turn it back to the panelists. Um, hi, this is a question for Jim. This may be a somewhat naive question, but I'll ask it anyway. 
Is there any impetus from those in the government, from those who are social actors, such as labor movements and NGOs, to invest in, let's say, alternative energy sources, companies that are working in that area, innovative uh, healthcare research, innovative housing production. Obviously, there are pressures on you to, to do well, but there are also probably pressures on you to do good. And I'm wondering how these play off each other. We'll take a couple more questions and we'll turn it back. Uh, just in the back here and then at the back. David Frazier from the Pew Charitable Trusts. Wondering if you could talk a little bit on the subject of risk about um, shared risk. And I'm thinking specifically of New Brunswick's shared risk pension plan, but mm. how widely accepted those principles have been in the public sector uh, pensions. Great, and then one more in the, in the back. Hi, uh, my name is Alexander Slater and I work at the World Bank. On the um, comparisons across countries, uh, I was wondering if you also were able to look at, um, you know, let's say the Canadian, Canadian funds have about an 8% return and American funds around 5%. Uh, what percent difference in fees did each did the, did the Canadian funds pay on generating those 8% returns versus the Americans pay, uh, generating the 5%? It would be interesting to know that. Um, and also, I'd love to hear from... Uh, uh, the two uh, pension fund CEOs, to what extent do you look at uh, not merely sort of um, socially responsible investing uh, activities, but also at, um, other markets like emerging markets? So why don't we work our way this way, starting with uh, Jim. Um, yeah, I mean, we do, there, there's uh, a lot of discussion out there in these days on uh, environmental, social, and governance factors. And, and we do take those into consideration in our investment activities and have for some time. Uh, we look at them as risk factors. So we, we're, we're a signatory of the UNPRI, and the UNPRI approach is that you should look at these things as risk factors and take that into consideration in your uh, investing and, and engage with your companies uh, in, in terms of in, in, that you're investing in and so make sure they're thinking about these things. And so. Uh, you know, we, uh, we we certainly still invest in in, in energy companies. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, alternative energy is is uh, in most cases we haven't invested in it because uh, the only reason why a lot of these things exist is because of, of the government subsidies. And if you took those subsidies away, uh, they're not economic. And so you know, we're always worried about those being stranded assets. So you know, if the subsidy goes away, well, you're left with a you know, wind farm that's not economic or something. So, so we, we tended to shy away from those things. It's, uh, uh, you know, if, if they were economic when they stood on their own, if they stood on their own, we we would invest in them. Uh, so it's not that we wouldn't. It's just, uh, but we do. Uh, you know, part of what we do is, is engage with companies. The biggest uh, thing that we can do in terms of uh, uh, directly is uh, in terms of. Um, Environmental is, is uh, we're a big direct holder of real estate, and uh, those buildings can have pretty high carbon footprints, and we do what we can to in those buildings to uh, reduce the carbon footprint uh, through uh, more efficient energy usage in those in our buildings, and also um, uh, we we also look at uh, uh, water usage in those buildings and. Um, um, solid waste, and we set targets for our managers to reduce those things and, and reduce them over time. So, uh, and it's it's a good thing because it actually, it's a, it's a win-win situation because uh, um, uh, if we, I mean, we, we all, any new buildings you build, we build, uh, built it at lead, lead platinum standards, which means it's extremely high energy efficient, and uh, it's a win-win for us because people will pay a premium rents for those buildings, and so uh, the incremental cost of building a new building that, to those standards is, is uh, like on five hundred million dollar projects, maybe it's another five or ten million dollars, and uh, uh, you'll get higher rents for the perpetuity of the building if you do that. So, it's, so the economics make sense. So, um, and uh, uh, so, uh, you know, there are a lot of pressures around these things. I mean, uh, we, we we do take into consideration in all our investing, but uh, um, and some of the things we uh, will do and some we won't. But but it's it's more again thinking about it from the members' point of view is it good for them and uh, you know some of these situations, that actually is a win-win, so it is both. Uh, do you want to comment on the 
I'm going to, I can comment. Risk sharing point or you want to? I'd like to talk a little bit about responsible investing too, because um, one thing that's really cool about being a, there's lots of really cool things about being a pension CEO, but it, doing it in uh, Toronto, uh, Toronto's kind of the Silicon Valley of the pension world, and it's a really interesting ecosystem. And even though I describe Hoop and OP Trust as uh, worshiping the same God, we have different religions. <laughs> and part of the different religion is uh, we're, we're very active, responsible investors. So we're active in alternative investing. We've taken a leadership role around the issue of climate change, uh, issued a, uh, a report in early January seeking disclosure that will allow us to engage. We don't believe in divestment when it comes to oil and gas and fossil, fossil fuels, but we do believe we need to better understand the climate risk of all the entities that we invest in. So we've put that report out. We've got another, uh, we've done some further work that will be published probably late in the year around the issue of climate change. Uh, we, so we uh, are engaged in that. We also have an incubation portfolio that we've established. It's about $300 million, about a point and a half of our assets notionally, where we want to, um, within the fiduciary context, of course, we want to look at different investment uh, approaches, the innovation economy, the disruption that, that's coming, so we can learn from it, make us better, help us better understand our investments, and really break one important part of the cycle that's going to change as a result of disruption. Investors value tangible assets. In the world that we're in now, intangibles play a role. We have to figure out how to invest that. Uh, New Brunswick, Alex is asking me to do that because uh, the New Brunswick model I fundamentally am opposed to. That was a significant uh, uh, benefit reduction for employees there, changed it from a final average plan to a career average plan. Uh, the employees bear the, the risks fundamentally there. Our jointly sponsored model, there is a, a risk sharing. The, the employees and the employer share the deficit and they share the surplus. If there's a deficit in our plans, our members are 50% responsible for it. That's part of the reason why when we manage our assets, the member interest is taken into account and we don't want that contribution level to go up. New Brunswick was in a tough circumstance. They thought that was the best answer, but I, I'm very uncomfortable with uh, target benefit plans because of uh, it puts too much risk on individuals and someone who is say 40-ish or 45, 20 years of service in those plans suffered a loss. And then the, I guess the last thing on emerging markets, uh, we have quite a bit of public market exposure. Well, about 10% of our assets would be in emerging or developing markets. This is an area of interest for us in alternatives as well. Um, so, and I wasn't saying you guys weren't to, responsible. To, Hugh, Hugh, just to be clear, your, your benefits are not variable, but your contributions can be affected. Well, if our, if our sponsors agreed to change benefits on a future-oriented basis, mm -hmm. they could do that. Right, but, but, but what happens is if your performance somehow went very badly, there would be, first order would be a change in the contribution. Probably. That's historically been the case, yes. Yeah, right. yeah it's, it's one of the, uh, the New Brunswick example has come up a fair amount in the U.S. context, but that's not the first shared risk plan that's been introduced in Canada. It's been around for a while, and I think, Jim, you want to comment on that yeah, as well? Yeah, I mean, who's been a shared risk plan from day one, uh, so since 1960? Uh, so, uh, and it's actually, we actually have, um, Flexible benefits as well. So the board does have the ability to, to alter some of the benefits, and the main one is, is uh, cost of living adjustments. So we do intend to pay cost of living adjustments on pension payments, 100% of CPI. Uh, but the board has, has the ability to take that to, to uh, no, no benefit, uh, uh, no no coal adjustments. Uh, we've never actually done it to take it to zero. We've taken it to 75% of CPI a couple of times when we faced funding challenges. Uh, it's a very big lever because it actually can improve your funded position by about 20 off the table. Uh, and it actually is, uh, the other thing that does is it, is it actually allows you to, to the, have the pension share in some of the risk because the people that are in retirement, because otherwise all the risk is borne by the active members. Uh, so that's the, new, the one place you can actually shift some of the risk onto, onto the retired population. So, so it, when you look at it on that uh, basis, uh, the, the employer is actually only uh, uh, the only obligation the employer has. So, so again, our plan is actually uh, not a government guarantee plan. So the government has no obligation. So if we have an underfund, they have no obligation to make that, that deficit up. It's really up to the board to just figure out how to do that. 
uh, and uh, uh, that can be done through uh, reduction of benefits or increasing the price to the to the, to the employer. So the only the only obligation the employer has is we can we can uh, increase the contribution rates going forward, and they they, they would uh, have an obligation to meet that. So, uh, and our plan is also voluntary. So if the employer doesn't like it; they can leave. But so uh, so it is. Uh, there's a lot of shared risk in the plan, and, and actually about two-thirds of the risk is actually borne by the members, about one-third by the employer. Josh, you want to just comment briefly on the fees issue that was raised? Because I know there's been a little bit more focus by governors and, and pension plan trustees on okay, that Okay, I'll, I'll try to be brief, brief on this one. Uh, full disclosure, I used to be a partner in a private equity firm. And what that meant is we went to institutions, including a lot of public U.S. pension funds, and said, if you invest money with us, We'll make you money, and we will charge you according to the usual rate, which was which the shorthand for which is two and twenty, two hundred basis points on whatever you invest with us per year, and twenty percent of any profits we make. We were more responsible than most, so we said twenty percent of any profits we make above a benchmark, which was your discount rate. In that case, eight uh, percent. So. Minimum cost of 200 basis points, right? Did you hear what Hugh said his costs are? Okay, That's, that is why I think that the direct investment model, the professional staff model, and the notion that public pensions perhaps should not be limited to uh, traditional civil service pay scales is worth considering because the results that these gentlemen and their colleagues have achieved are much better than the results that in some cases even the best US public plans have achieved and since everybody is trying to do everybody is trying to figure out how can you improve retirement security at whatever is an affordable cost this is a model that's worth considering Terrific. Um, I think we're at 3.30 now. I don't know yeah, if you want are. to take a few more questions, David, or how you want yes. to proceed. <laughs> okay, let's do, do one more round of questions, and uh, why don't we start on this side, and we'll work our way around. Hi. Uh, Connie Donovan from uh, PBGC. I'm the uh, participant plan sponsor advocate. And, um, and I did I'm, not pay her to be here. <laughs> yeah, that's at right. Least, at least one person in the room has an easy job. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really, it's a fun job, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of a tripart question, a little bit for in Josh's space based on his experience. Um, do you see in the public pension space in the U.S. any bright spots that are <coughs> somewhat mirroring what you're seeing uh, on the Canadian side, so that's kind of question number one. And question number two is, um, do you see any lessons on the Canadian side that can be learned with our ERISA-covered, eroding defined benefit plans um, in terms of uh, best practices, uh, regulatory changes, policy kinds of changes? And then the last question, and I'll stop, is... Um, do you see any possibility of a public-private sector uh, kind of relationship in potentially supporting a stronger DB benefit structure in the U.S.? And, and for the whole panel, I mean, I know Josh, but mm -hmm. you know, for the whole panel, obviously. Thank you. So why don't, we, why don't we go over to this side and then to Will. Also on governance and, and oversight, there seems to be a need for a balance be, between enough government oversight so you're, the managers are doing their fiduciary duty at minimum, but enough arm's length so they can be enterprising and run like a business and pay well. So that seems to be the, some of the consensus. And in Ontario, I just wondered, in, in the U.S., ERISA excludes government plans, our, our pension law, our pension oversight law and our guarantee fund. Is there any federal role in Canada for the Ontario if, over the province and, uh, and their public sector plans? How do you guys manage that, that, that tension between <laughs> oversight and creativity? And then one more question. The world price and the World Bank, although this is from my former life working in the UK, 
So there were a set of public plans in the UK, about 100 of them for local government plans, which existed for about 60, 70 years and have recently been forced to amalgamate to about 10, and maybe that the number should have been uh, lower. The question then for the panel and advice for the US um, participants, what's the kind of scale of a plan in terms of billions under management which you would feel is the kind of minimum that you would take on and build out as something that could be world-class? Terrific. So why don't we start with Josh, because there was a question about ERISA-covered plans and a number of other questions um, were directed at you. There are lots of folks within U.S. public plans who are taking to heart some of these lessons. Um, CalPERS and CalSTRS have both, within the last couple of years, done, each of them has done, in one case, said, okay, I'm going to disinvest in a class of investment managers because I find the fees too high, and also I'm going to do some experimentation with, I'm going to spend some time doing direct investment. In fact, they... The idea that, that U.S. pension funds work only through consultants and only through, uh, and only through funds of funds is just plain not true. U.S. pension funds, public funds have always had some direct, direct investment, uh, et cetera, and, but have moved away from it in part, frankly, because of the influence of ERISA and ERISA, and ERISA plans. And so I would... Uh, so I think there's motion there. What I hope this panel does, is, though, is kind of spur a rethinking in a, in a, in a broader range. Um, I would rather defer to a private forum as to what the lessons are for ERISA plans. Uh, my personal, my shorthand for this is, had the actuarial profession in the U.S. been as conservative as the actuarial profession was in Canada, in other words, and therefore had private plans been required to put aside the right amount of money that turned out to be necessary, uh, we'd probably still have, we'd have a lot more ongoing defined benefit plans in, in the private sector than we do. Hugh, can you speak to the, the importance of the regulatory environment yeah. and, and the question yeah. about so, uh, government? <clears throat> uh, I could take you through the delights of Canadian constitutional law, but... <laughs> um, which is interesting. It's quite different than yours. But uh, under the Canadian law, uh, federally regulated institutions are the only ones subject to federal pension legislation. So it's a small part of the economy, airlines, uh, railways, telecom, thing, uh, uranium mines, stuff like that. Uh, so in Ontario, uh, uh, organizations like ours are subject to the Provincial Pension Benefits Act and the Federal Income Tax Act. Uh, Income Tax Act really speaks to funding issues. So we're subject to, uh, we're, we're, we're given certain breaks under the Pension Benefits Act. They're less unique than they were. We're required to fund on a going concern basis, whereas in the private sector, there was a solvency uh, basis uh, to them. Both of our plans are, uh, are well-funded on a solvency basis, I, I would point out. Um, governance and oversight and those sorts of things, I guess, comes down to, for me, three fundamental issues. One, trust. We can, uh, you know, set up, we can have a guard in every room. Absent trust, we can't make the governance work. Two, clear, clear criteria to hold us accountable. And by us, I mean management. And that, to me, is why funded status matters. We can talk about first quartile performance, I outperform this plan, whatever. You know, it doesn't really matter. What matters is what's our funded position, how well have we done uh, uh, protecting it. And then three, I think it's the issue of how transparent, how open uh, management is with the board in telling them the good and the bad. Those are, uh, those are the, the three key things that I, I see. Perfect. Jim, do you want to speak to the scale question? Uh, yeah, yeah, we've actually had some few discussions with some UK funds on that and they've come to see us. But, but the, uh, you know, I think the, the, the important uh, thing in scale is, is getting the size where you can, uh, the, uh, the economies of scale make sense to have in source your management. And in today's world, that's probably somewhere around 20 billion. Uh, uh, you know, I think he was just getting the threshold at that level right now, and then they're starting to in source things. But, but it, it's, um, um, 
that's probably a moving target over time, but it's, it's uh, you know, I think when we first did it, we were less than that, but the markers are much smaller than that. So, uh, you know, certainly, uh, I, I would think a ideal size somewhere, to me, is somewhere between 30 and 50 billion. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think of that, you know, the, in that case, you're big enough to insource your, your, your asset management, you're able to uh, have scale to get involved in a lot of different activities that you couldn't otherwise get involved in, but you're not too big, you're gonna move markets around things. So, uh, you know, when you get up to, you know, three to 500 billion, mm -hmm. I think you start getting uh, discounts of scale. So, you know, there's, there's a sweet spot in there that you wanna be in. So just one last comment from here. Yeah, I, I just say a couple things. First of all, we have internally managed our alternatives for a dozen years, and we did it probably starting at nine and ten billion dollars a year you'll often hear that you need to have massive massive scale to be in the alternatives I, i'm not certain that's true i think it's a matter of what the boards are prepared to do how they're prepared to bear risk the other thing is technology has changed a lot of things we have into we now internally manage our bonds fx and uh, we're adding derivative products we're able to do that because we outsource our middle and back office to our custodian and i think I mean, Jim makes, Jim is without question the best, in my opinion, best pension investor on the planet. And I, I take seriously the things he says, but innovation also comes from smaller players. And, and I think there's a real balance here. And it's not necessarily that size dictates it. I think the story of the Canadian model, the story, the story Hassan told, it's also a matter of taking the risk, having the will to do it. Yeah, one thing that you touched on there was, it was uh, uh, technology as well, and, and that's one of the big advantages to scale is you actually have the money to do things like that. Technology is critically important to the success of any organization to keep you on the leading edge of things and allow you to do things much more co in a much more cost-effective manner. And uh, you know, you do need this sufficient scale to be able to do that. And you know, and just an example. I mean, we spent uh, on trading systems and control environment, we've probably spent $100 million or so uh, over a couple year period to, to allow us to do things we want to do. I mean, you have to be pretty big to be able to throw that kind of money at it. So it's not, uh, uh, so you, you know, it, 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 there, is, uh, there is an optimum space, but you need to have, hit a certain threshold. And, uh, you know, you can argue whether it's 10 or 20 billion, but it's a big number, like it's not a... Yeah. Jim, I think earlier today you referred to the Canadian model as a uh, an evolution, not a revolution. Uh, we did have a chance to uh, scratch the surface today on some uh, major issues, but I did want to mention, for those of you who are interested in, in diving into more depth, a number of us have had the privilege of collaborating with the World Bank over the last year or so to try and document a bit of the story over the last 20 to 30 years of the Canadian model, lessons learned, good and bad, uh, and I think touching on a lot of the questions that were raised in a lot more depth in the audience. So that is coming out later, uh, later in November. Keep an eye out for that. Um, Josh, do you have one last comment before we wrap up? I think given this panel, the Canadian should have the last word, period. Um, well, I'm often heard to say, I, I think Canadians can be amongst the smuggest people in the world. And uh, <laughs> in telling this, look, our, our model comes out of a bunch of mistakes, of a lot of failure and learning from it. I think the U.S. is at an inflection point now, and I think uh, with... Uh, political will with uh, people putting uh, the unions, the members of these plans, I think you can achieve, uh, you can achieve and perhaps even go beyond us. So that would be my view. Terrific. Well, I hope you'll join me in thanking. Well, uh, oh, poor Jim didn't get Jim the last Jim didn't get the last word. word. Okay. I'll let you have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> so please join me in thanking uh, the panelists.